Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, yep, we are in the right frame. Carnegie. 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 Okay. Yeah, Carnegie Hall. Gallagher. Gallagher. Mr. Kimball Gallagher. Okay. Yes, there you go. Great. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, well, well. So we're gonna we're gonna begin our stuff. I, I will not need to mention that you'll be performing at the art of business and business of art international conference. Do I need to do that? I don't think so. I don't want to do that. I don't want to promote that. But well, although they paid for it. <laughs> they, well, essentially they sponsor. Yeah, um, I mean they're sponsoring my trip here, so, so actually I think me. it would be good to mention. Yeah, they sponsor your trip and me. <laughs> I think it would be bad if we didn't mention them. If you don't mention them, I'll mention them. So. Yeah. No, I have to mention first. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Otherwise they will never want me again. Yeah. <laughs> that would be... That would be that the guy be. organizing the conference, Kerpal, do you know? Yeah, him? yeah, yeah. He's a great yeah. guy. Yeah, really yeah, interesting you, guy. You met him already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. He's a great guy. He's a, he's a, he's he's my sponsor. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's more excuse for me to say it. Exactly. Okay. So are you in the mood right now? Yeah, I'm no? ready to go. Okay. One, two, and three. Hi, welcome to the National Grid Stories Online News. I'm Robin Steinberg, and welcome to the Steinberg Review. And today we have a special guest all the way from the United States and who has just arrived from India actually uh, to attend uh, and perform uh, this special conference here with the Singapore Management University that's organizing the Art of Business and the Business of Art International Conference. And here we have uh, Mr. Kimball uh, Gallagher uh, who is going to be performing uh, here in Singapore as part of the uh, concert tour uh, around the world. Uh, he actually is a, you know, a graduate from the Juliet School uh, from New York and he has also performed uh, at the uh, Carnegie uh, uh, Hall in New York. And now we have uh, Mr. Kimball who's going to tell us more about what he's going to do and his perspective on music. Mr. Kimball, thank you and welcome to our show. Thank and, you for having me. And you know, I I hope that I got it right this time, Rob. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you, it was great. It was, it was great. a uh, it was a real challenge uh, for me to face uh, many uh, guests like yourself, uh, you know, to to actually explore insights, mm -hmm. you know, and and their psyche about the perspective of life. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Mr. Kimball, now that you're here in Singapore mm -hmm. and you, you'll be performing on Thursday at, at the Singapore. Uh, management University mm -hmm. uh, for this wonderful conference that they're putting on especially you know Gopal has done a great job uh, with us um, how has how has your experience been uh, for you your journey as a artist you know, you're a p classical pianist mm -hmm. in fact mm -hmm. and so tell us and uh, tell our viewers how did you first discover you know, that you had that knack a talent to be a pianist <laughs> well, when I was a kid, my father was my first teacher when I was five years old, mm -hmm. and so it was something that was happening around the house. I didn't like it much. I finally quit when I was ten, and then I started to come around to it myself. My father always had music playing, and he played himself. Um, and then I was about twelve or thirteen, I discovered the music of Frederick Chopin, and I became obsessed with Chopin. So I was always practicing these pieces, many of which were too difficult for me at oh, the yeah, time. Yeah, sure. um, but this led to me doing my first recital. Um, and I was actually mentored by a friend of our family. His name is Joseph Smith. He lives in New York. He's a pianist. Uh, and he sort of guided me a little bit through this first performance. And it was supposed to be a very small performance at our house for like 10 people in the living room. But it turned out it was at the local piano store. And uh, we had. 70 people, but for somebody who had never performed, and I never had institutional training, I wasn't part of a, you know, many many kids that went to Juilliard, they go to Juilliard pre-college from very young age, and so they had a lot of training and performance and everything like this, but this is my first thing, I was 15 already. So um, that sort of was the first time I really started to take myself seriously as a pianist, and it sort of went from there. Um, I started, I got a, 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 a a formalized teacher at New England Conservatory. I grew up in Boston and then I ended up going to Rice University in Houston, Texas and then the Juilliard School in New York and I've lived there ever since. So that's sort of the backstory from childhood up. Um, wow, now, yeah. now tell me, what's 
music to you? What is the definition of music uh, for you as a classical pianist? Well, the definition of music. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different definitions of music. But personally, depending for you. on who you talk to, uh, <laughs> for me, wow, I haven't thought about it so much in this philosophical context. I mean, I guess it's about the relationship between silence and um, organized sound. Huh. If you want to be very abstract about it, <laughs> um, organized sound. Well, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, well, you know, there's composers like, I mean, most famously like John Cage, who totally exploded the way people thought, mm -hmm. at least in the West, about um, about what music is. He was constantly asking that question again and again. And he has a famous piece called 433, which is just four minutes and 33 seconds of pure silence. So you're just supposed to come out on stage, take a bow, sit down at your instrument, and sit there for four minutes and 33 seconds. Really? And then walk off stage, yes. He did nothing, just sit there mm -hmm. and not play a, a yeah. single note. And I mean, you can decide for yourself what that means, but then when people are sitting there, there's some sense of expectation that something's going to happen, and then you might listen to sounds differently and hear your environment in a different way. And I don't know what Mr. Cage would say, but you know, some people would argue it's a form of music. It's a form of, because it, it brings people's attention to certain details in the surroundings. Are you going to attend to do that in Singapore? That's, that's <laughs> not, that particular piece is not on the program. No, I mean, uh, my viewpoint for the concerts is a little bit more conventional. You know, okay. I sit down and play music. Most of it has melodies uh -huh. and harmonies, and most of it's, you know, fairly accessible. Yeah. I like the idea of silence. I think no one has ever attempted to, to just come to a stage and done nothing but just sit there yeah. and not play a note. Maybe you should you should be the first. No, just kidding. But no, well, I wouldn't be the first. I wouldn't be the first. But I could <laughs> add that to the program. You, know, you, you yeah. could be the first in we, Singapore. We could, we could perform it right now on, on this camp. <laughs> oh no, no, not on TV. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't work. It wouldn't no, work. that would be that would be too strenuous. But yeah, you know what? <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of of being, uh, you know, understood mm -hmm. as a pianist. Yes. Uh, had, did your parents actually encourage you, or did they actually feel encouraged that you did, you have decided that you want to be a pianist? Well, I'm actually not sure exactly what they think. You'd have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will say that you know, from a parental standpoint, the sort of normal concerns that most parents that I've talked to have is often like, well, how do you make a living as a pianist? Mm -hmm. And this is an area that I'm very interested in. I've actually. Uh, we'll be doing a talk at the conference on the Friday after the performance called The Entrepreneurial Artist, where I'll talk mm -hmm. about yes. um, some of my own entrepreneurial approaches yes. and uh, you know what I sort of conceive of as an entrepreneurial mindset for artists. Mm -hmm. And it's led me to do a number of things that for myself have been uh, very exciting and really at the core of not exactly what music is, but some of the best ways to reach audiences. And that's yes. what I'd like to, to start talking about because uh, the, the main thing was um, playing many concerts in small venues or in private homes especially. Because if when a concert happens in a private home, um, first of all, most classical music that was written for piano, like by composers like Chopin and even Beethoven and Mozart and these sort of standard classical music composers, they were actually conceived for not only small spaces, but many of them were actually conceived mm -hmm. for private home venues. And it was understood the audience mm -hmm. would be you know, maybe a host and their friends mm -hmm. or their colleagues or people, they, their family, things like mm -hmm. that. And there's a certain atmosphere that that creates, a certain receptivity that the audience will have, and also a way of interacting with the artist that's different from a concert hall. A concert hall, generally, there's, um, there's some space, physical separation, as yes. well as there might be a stage, and there's just there's some distance between the artist and the audience. And that presents a slightly different dynamic between the artist, mm -hmm. the audience, and the performer. Whereas I've really explored a lot this more intimate and immediate way of doing this. And that is the idea, that was the seed of the idea that grew to, to start to create this 88 concert tour, which I've done. And that's an international tour. There's 88 keys on the piano, that's why it's 88. And it was to explore what I call salon-style concerts huh. all over the world. And there's certain places in the world where this is common, and there's certain places where it's not common. And I'm trying to introduce the concept and get people acquainted with it. Um, it's really about entertaining in the home and having music when people are really in a relaxed setting. You know, you play in a concert hall, and this happened in India. You mentioned I just come from India, and it's sort of a very standard concert format. People come in, there could be a hundred people there. You talk, you have this like experience, this emotional, sort of spiritual, emotional, physical experience with this with the music and playing and everything. And then the people leave, 
and I don't get to, it feels, it feels uncomfortable to me to have this moment with them, and then they just walk out the door, and there's no time or chance to connect with the audience on another level, and I really appreciate that opportunity. And in a home, you can have that, so you, as an artist, you speak to the audience, you get some feedback, you find out what they thought about the concert, you can talk about other things, and to me that makes the experience of the concert complete, more complete. Now, what is music for the people in India, in your observation? What is, did they, did they tell you what's the definition of music to them? <laughs> well, I didn't sit them down and interview them on the definition of music, but, it's but, a, but your, your well, observation. some of the interesting things are, um, well, there's a few things. One, in India, there's what they, they constantly refer to Western classical music, and that's to make a distinction between Western classical and Indian classical. Um, and also, I'm just learning about India, so I cannot speak about Indian classical music with any authority, but, you know, Northern Indian music is different than Southern Indian music. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many different um, yes. kinds of people there. Um, so, but what, know, is your, but what is your perspective? I think that, well, there, are, there is a group that is very, that is interested in Western classical music, and that's what I was trying to present in mm -hmm. an accessible way, and I actually played two pieces by composers, Rina Ismail and Michael Harrison, mm -hmm. both of which were sort of a standard Western classical music format, but where the musical content had a very strong Indian influence. Um, one of them was based on a Farsi melody, it was actually an old melody, and uh, treated the way an Indian classical piece would be treated, and then uh, Rina's piece actually used a specific Indian raga, uh, which is just a s sort of scale. It has a certain flavor, musical flavor to it. And so the audiences were able to uh, recognize these elements um, as their sort of native music, um, in perhaps in unexpected ways. So, I mean, I think, in general, though, I think Indians would treat music and give a similar definition than Westerners in a, in a general sense. Now, th yeah. is this your first time coming out from the United States into Asia? Around. Oh no, this is, um, I mean, I haven't been to Asia many, many times. This is maybe my fourth or fifth trip to Asia. Uh, um, and, and how about your trip to Singapore? Second time in Singapore. So second Singapore. Oh, yes. okay. This will be my first time I'm uh, performing in Singapore. I was here oh. before at NUS doing a, a lecture and a master class. Oh, that's in, nice. I believe April or March of this year. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Now, how, how is your, your observation about Singapore right now? Have you tried any, any other local cuisine? Well, I'll tell you, compared to India, it's just amazing. It's, it's pristine, organized, um, very clean, uh -huh. you know. Uh, now, that's not a statement about India, but there, in India, there's sort of a perpetual uh, uncertainty about, you know, if things are going to happen on time or things of that nature. Uh, you kind of never know what's about to happen in India, which is kind of exciting in its own way. Uh, local cuisine, I love the coconuts, fresh coconuts especially <laughs> Fresh coconuts, I tell you, folks, uh, please uh, come by to Singapore and try the fresh coconuts. <laughs> and uh, no, like like Mr. Uh, Kimball says, I tell you, it's indeed really fresh. Yeah. And um, but you know, you know, strangely, I can't find uh, fresh coconuts in in uh, in the United States. I mean, I, I I don't remember, you know, when I was back in San Francisco or mm -hmm. LA, I, mm -hmm. I I couldn't find any fresh coconuts there. And, uh, yeah, there's one place in New York out in Queens that I've had them, at least one. I know there's more than one, but I think they have to be imported, and yeah. so I think it might be... Oh, wait, it might be Hawaii. Thing. I think I had fresh coconuts in oh, Hawaii, yes. yes. Yes, that's right, yeah. So, but, but hey, that's Hawaii, you know. Um, but you got to try coconuts from Asia. Yeah, and, it's uh, a different beast. It's, a t it's totally out, out, <laughs> out, of, out, of, out of experience. But Mr. Kimball, now... Yeah. Uh, Moving forward, you know, is the uh, the, the definition of music, mm -hmm. you know, has that changed uh, the way you see music, you know, ten years ago than now? Well, I would um, I would I would say that my feeling and impression of the music business has changed. Um, I don't know that I would say that, that my understanding of music itself has changed. Um, I would say maybe I've changed a little bit about what music can do and what it can be because I've been exploring music in what I usually say music in humanitarian contexts um, and using music to sort of cross cultural barriers and to bring people together that might be uh, unexpected uh, in unexpected ways. So, for example, in India, all my uh, in four of the cities I was working with, 
um, NGOs that work with waste pickers, people that sort, gather and sort trash and recyclables. And these, um, these people have, you know, in recent history are sort of an untouchable part of society, like the poorest of the poorest of the poor. Um, and they make their living literally like finding trash and selling it, trying to find the valuable materials within it. And so I came up with this idea that, you know, in, in, in environmentalism we talk about economy of means, making the most of whatever materials we have, especially in terms of recycling. You know, you, you use something once and then you know, what else can you do with this? How else can this be transformed into usable material? How can we um, save and, 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 and uh, make the most out of our resources? And it's a sort of a lofty idea, but classical composers actually do very, very much the same thing with musical materials. And I gave the example of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which is one of the most mm -hmm. famous yeah, piano pieces right. ever written. Right. And it starts off, and in the right hand there are these three notes. Da, 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 ba, da, da. And, uh, you know, in a way that this is just a three note rhythm, um, but it happens, I counted, 268 times in really? just the you first four it. minutes. Wow. And, uh, well, it's easy, there's four times per measure, and you just count the number of measures and multiply by four, it's not that hard. But, so, but it struck me that um, very often times composers use a very, very simple musical idea, mm -hmm. and then that idea is developed throughout the piece uh, of music, and they're really just using the source material is very, very small, and from that they're generating all these different ideas. So that's the metaphor um, that I use to, to reach in. I also composed some pieces uh, for specific waste pickers into each cities uh, that I was in, and um, so it was just fascinating. And I don't think any of these people, the waste pickers, had heard Beethoven before. This was a new experience for them, wow. and a new way of acknowledging them. So using music in this in this manner um, is something I would definitely not have thought of ten years ago. Now moving forward, now, uh, artist management itself today presents a one, one of those uh, probably the most challenging uh, jobs uh, today I, I, would, mm -hmm. I would assume because um, I used to be involved in artist management a long time ago mm -hmm. and I know that there's a lot of work involved mm -hmm. now in Asia itself Singapore especially uh, artist management you know, is, a, is a very new industry mm -hmm. for most musicians uh, in Asia and where you're coming from in New York, of course, in the United States, artist management is pretty much very well established. Mm -hmm. And I like to educate that our audience and our viewers right now. Uh, they're trying to understand what is the the job of the artist manager mm -hmm. and what does the artist like yourself uh, would define the, the job scope of the artist manager and what the, does the artist manager actually do mm -hmm. uh, for an artist, yeah. you know? Well, it's a great question and I think the answer is something that's always is, is changed and evolved over time. Mm -hmm. um, now, to be honest, I don't have a manager, right? Mm -hmm. There's a manager I work with um, in some of the places that I go to, uh, the different people, but I, I, I do what I would call self-management mm -hmm. in yes. a sense. So, um, you know, in the purest sense, a manager manages, right? So when you have, um, if you're trying to, you know, make a living playing concerts, you very oftentimes you need to play a, a certain number of concerts in a certain amount of time, and you know you need to coordinating the logistics of that is very comp can be very complex because you're working with maybe each concert is a different organization, so you need to work with that organization, find the date, make sure the travel arrangements make sense, you're not spending too much money on flights, um, you have to arrange hotels, places to stay, um, things like that, you have to figure out what repertoire you're going to play, and so, you know, depending on the artist and, you know, how much repertoire you have ready to go, uh, you know, if you play one piece, one concerto, say, with an orchestra on one night, you know, maybe the next night isn't the best night to play a totally unrelated solo program. You know what I'm saying? Because it's two different kinds of music, two different sets of music you would need to have ready at the same time. So it's strategically figuring out what the repertoire is going to be. These are all the kinds of concerns. I, I deal with them myself as a self-manager, but I think managers, uh, ideally they're involved in these, these concerns and these situations. I think in reality, a lot of the managers that I've spoken to and worked with and I've known about that my friends work with, um, still a lot of the, the, um, the effort 
to find new opportunities has to come from the artist. And the manager can sort of step in at moments and make an introduction or make a connection and like, oh, you're going to Singapore. Well, I know this, there's a conductor there. You've got to meet this conductor. Why don't you try to play for the conductor? And then you play for the conductor and maybe he'll hire you in two or three seasons, you know? Or, or maybe the manager, because the managers are sort of, um, you know, if they're good, they're keeping tabs on the way things are going in different places. Maybe there's a cancellation in an orchestra and they call a manager because a manager has easy access to a lot of high-level artists. So they might say, oh, you know, we, we just had a cancellation in Bangkok. We need someone to come there. And then the manager can say, oh, well, I have an artist who plays that concerto. They could do that tomorrow, no problem. So then you get the call from the manager. We need to help, you know, substitute. That, that's the third sort of thing that I've heard of happening. Um, there's not too many managers out there, to my knowledge, that are really in the business of building careers for artists from the ground up. They need to find artists who've already been able to establish themselves to some degree, and they have some visibility, and then they can work with that. That's my understanding. Um, that I don't but, know. But, but isn't it the job of the manager had, uh, has to market the artists? Absolutely. Yeah. You, they, In the simple terms, that's yeah. They, they, the they, they, I mean, they have to go around you know, to different uh, concert halls and, and sorts and radio stations. And, and yeah. I think that's. To, to my knowledge, there's not too many managers who are doing that in like a hardcore way these days. That, oh, yeah. I think that used to. Does that, that, change? To my knowledge, it has changed. Okay. So, so what's what's the what? What is the there present are, trend? It depends. Time? It depends. It depends who you talk to. It depends what it is. And honestly, like I said, I don't really know because I'm not yeah, really in that world. I do. Yeah, I do for myself. So yes, I yes. do think some some managers will will uh, go around to different concert halls, but I think it's done strategically. It's not done. They don't just have a list of concert halls. Go down the list every single concert hall. Mm -hmm. It's more like, it's more like, oh, you've played in, uh, you know, California before. Okay, let's. Okay, if you've played in Los Angeles, let's try to work with California. Okay, maybe there's some other places you can go in Los Angeles. Maybe you can go to some other places in California, and then they might pick concert venues based on that. Do you see what I mean? As yes, opposed to just completely out of the, out of the blue. Oh, okay. So that, that's my understanding. I, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I'm now, not an expert. Now we have a, a good number of artists uh, in Asia, even in Singapore, who are actually self-managed themselves. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, probably a perfect example that you could uh, explain mm -hmm. to our viewers, especially those artists who are self-managing themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them who are brand new. They uh, mm -hmm. they just published their first album or their first EP and find themselves a little bit discouraged mm -hmm. in, in some sense. Now, could you give some encouragement also to, to define uh, your job scope as a artist mm -hmm. and self-manager? Mm -hmm. You know, how did you uh, succeed in finding the opportunities to perform yeah. and still make a living? You're doing well, this on a full-time basis, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, the job scope is quite wide. And I think that um, there's a lot of different ways it can go with this question. I mean, for example, uh, I like to put things in terms of projects because I find that it's easier to market a project and that the project becomes part of, uh, linked with your identity as an artist. So for example, I'm doing the 88 concert tour and this is to promote salon style concerts mm -hmm. um, and ways of personalizing concerts, right? So that was one idea that I had, for example. So I don't just make a CD um, or let, let me just say, put, it, put it a different way. If I create a concert program, it's going to be for a specific occasion or a series of occasions. It's going to be customized. So I think the level of customization um, is really important, and artists need to think about that. Um, and I, you know, I've explored the salon style concert, so I'm actually looking strategically for people who have private homes where they might like to host concerts. Uh, that's something I very much enjoy doing. And it's become part of, uh, you know, sort of my persona as an artist. Every People start to know, like, oh, that's the guy who does a lot of home concerts. Now, that's not the only thing I do, but within that, I've explored, um, as a classical artist, how to speak to an audience. What kinds of things are going to help them listen to the music in a, maybe in an unexpected way or a new way or a fresh way? Or to audiences who've never, maybe never heard the music before, you might speak a little differently to somebody who's well-versed in all the vocabulary of music and knows the composers, you know, it's different if you don't know anything. So, um, you know, I urge, I would urge artists to get perspective on all of these things, figure out who exactly their audience is, mm -hmm. who do they want it to be, 
And uh, you know, on another level, it's like, who are they as artists? Like, what is their, are there, is there a certain repertoire they want to specialize in? Is there a way to create a special project that works with that repertoire and that music? You know, just to keep using India since it's a fresh example, that was an exploration for me of, can I combine Western classical music and all these music societies in India that I was working with, with environmental NGOs? You know, and, and so a lot of people, they hear that for the first time, and they go, oh, it seems like a very unexpected combination, it's like not normally done like that, blah, blah, blah. That's the whole point, you know? I'm trying to see, can music be an effective tool for these organizations? Is it something they're going to respond to? And I found, actually found it was great. There's a lot of enthusiasm. A lot of the schools that I played at are eager to actually do more outreach concerts for some of the waste pickers. They're eager to continue the relationship, and I myself am hoping to go back um, to India and continue this concept and maybe go to other places and do concerts. It gives the concert a context, it gives people something to, th to think about, a, a new way of looking at things. So I always encourage artists, take risks, you have to take risks. They need to be calculated and, they, and, and thoughtful, um, but you, you have to got to try some new things, not in a gimmicky way, but in a, in a sincere way. And that's the way I was, uh, that, that's that concept that I had behind the, 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 the economy of means, showing how Beethoven is very efficient with his use of materials and things like that. Um, so but music is amazing because it can be molded and, and, and um, I didn't mean molded so much, but you can put music in any context that's gonna have some importance. You can look at it in many different angles. It'd be very interesting, it's flexible. Now, are you a people person? You seem to be, uh, you know, you like, you like to, uh, approach people and you like to get in contact with people. Are you a, a self uh, salesman? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry to ask that. No, no, I do. I like meeting people. I'm very interested in uh, people's life stories and their own journeys. Mm -hmm. And I try to view my own life in that way. And I think that story is one of the best sales tools, if you want to speak in those terms as well. Uh, because it's easy for people to relate to stories, it gives them something to hold on to, it's easy to understand. Um, so, so yes, the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> it must be challenging for you to meet those people in India. I mean, did you have any problems in trying to connect with them? Since, because, oh. you're, because you're crossing a different culture right now. Yeah. yeah. There's different cultural... Um, it's sort of fresh in my mind, I'm still reflecting on it. Like in India, I found there was much less small talk like in the U.S. and in Singapore too, there's a lot of small talks. Like, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, what do you think about that? In India, it's just right to the, right to the topic. Really? Oh yeah. Uh, I thought then, they talk a lot. I didn't. There, there. It's not that there's not a lot of talking. It's just there's no small talk. So when I call somebody on the phone, it's not like, hey, how's it going? It's, you know, I'll be there at six by. You know, it's like. That's Very the, short, the, the, okay. quick, quick communication, <laughs> fast pace of communication. Uh, that that's what I found. I mean, not with every single person, but just as a general, okay. as a general thing. So yeah, that's part of what I enjoy is exploring how do you, how do we connect with these people in different cultures? How do I understand their culture? How can I present myself in a way that they're going to understand? And I think what I was doing there it was very new to a lot of the people involved in Western classical music there, so it had to be presented in a, in a certain way. Um, you know, in New York, people are, there's constantly these, like, unusual projects with classical music. So, in that context, you don't have, you can explain things in a different manner, you know? Now, we have a lot of uh, Asians, especially in Singapore, again, there's another question uh, for you. Yeah. Uh, about the entrepreneurship and, and series. And now, the first question I asked just now was about, you know, uh, how do you manage to self-manage? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to move forward to uh, to another subject. It's about the uh, the managing of, of of artists themselves. Artists themselves in Singapore f find a challenge uh, to market themselves because mm -hmm. they say, and their their rational explanation is that uh, the market is too small. I got to hold on to a second job. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. If I leave my job, I won't have any stable income. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, mm -hmm. because they they're too afraid that you know they may not be able to get a rice uh, bowl on their table. So, but you have su successfully you know uh, done it, self-employed, you know, and self mm -hmm. sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now, how can an artist able to start a career mm -hmm. with no management, 
they may, may they may not have uh, enough financial resources, mm -hmm. but in a country like Singapore, it's small, and you've you've been here now for the second time. You know, it's a small country itself; it's an island. How can an artist uh, learn from you? Mm -hmm. Lesson the best practices on how they should uh, market themselves, yeah. and work hard, and at the same time, what measure of risk can they take? Well, I would say to, for marketing purposes. Now, it depends what what genre of music they're playing, and mm -hmm. you know the way they like to do that. One of the most effective uh, marketing tools that I've used, um, and I didn't even think of it as marketing at the time, was that I had regular concerts in my own apartment. And they were not paid. I didn't do this to, to it was not a, a business venture, but um, uh, I started this series called Cocktails and Counterpoints with a, a close friend of mine named David Rosenzweig. Um, and he actually has lived in Singapore for a while. But he's from New York, uh, or we met in New York, and the concept was simply to bring. Um, at first, it was going to be bringing his friends, and most of them were from business school. They actually were not artists, or maybe they had taken piano lessons as a kid. But they were interested in art, but they didn't have a way to access it. Um, and, and when I say that, I mean it's, they lived in New York. There's tons of art going on, um, and even in Singapore, there's lots of art actually going on, but. They didn't have a personal contact with the people putting on the art. So they would just open up a newspaper and there'd be all these listings and it's like, well, you know, they had nothing to, to grab onto. So I always encourage artists to have small events, private events, so you can get to know people that are interested in coming. And try to get a partner, work with somebody who... So I would, if I was talking to somebody in Singapore, um, this is just an experiment. Like I don't know if this would work in Singapore. So I would say this is the kind of experiment. It's very, very low cost. There's virtually no risk, and there's only stuff to gain. I would find, you know, I'd find a friend who likes what I do, and says, "Hey, you know, let's let's start a series. It's going to be a private series, and it might revolve around that one particular artist, or maybe you find say two or three artists, and you sort of rotate, or you can each play a little bit at each concert." And you get together a group of maybe 10, 20 people and have them over to the apartment. Even if it's a small apartment, you can do this. In fact, small is sometimes better. You have the music uh, right up close, maybe have some wine, maybe some snacks, some drinks, whatever. Um, low cost, again, you can ask each person to sort of bring, maybe bring a little bit. And I've done this in New York maybe 15, 16 times over the past two, three years, and I have made so many new friends. And so many people have come and like, oh, we've never been to a concert in a house, this is really interesting. And then I've gotten to know them. And I've sort of, it's a way of developing your own fan base on, a, on certain levels. And how does this convert into actually making money? Well, these are people who, when you do have a, a public concert, when there is paid tickets, hopefully they'll come and support you. And you can ask them. And the thing is, in the private concerts, it's an opportunity to explain the nature of your career. What are you trying to do? So I don't ask them for money or, or, or ask them to come to paid events very often, um, but occasionally there'll be something. Like when I did this Asia tour that I'm on now, we had to do a fundraiser in New York for the India tour, so that was the one time. But I'm hoping that those people, wow, they've been, they might, maybe they've been invited to my apartment uh, or a friend's apartment for this series maybe five, six times. And it's only at the seventh time where it's like, okay, now please support this and the tickets, you know, 20 or $50 or whatever. Huh. But well, there's a base of people, and on nice. the another level, uh, since I'm looking at the whole world as a possibility for, mm -hmm. for concerts, so many of the new friends I've met through this um, have international contacts, and so I've been able to develop other relationships through those people. Um, so it's kind of like creating a base of support for yourself. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I would say for artists is that they need to create not just a, a base of support, sort of fans, but to also create... Uh, like an inner circle of support, like sort of like a personal board of directors in a way. You know, um, I would try to talk to people about marketing. Maybe get to know somebody who's really good at marketing. Um, have them ask them if they would like be on your personal board of directors. You know, help manage their career. There's no reason. I have so many people who are.